Okay, so our first speaker is, I'll try and do this as an authentic accent, Ryan McGranachan. <laughs> no, Ryan, Ryan McGranachan, who is a PhD candidate uh, at the University of Colorado. It's a pleasure to have a CU student here um, in the aerospace engineering department. Uh, he is a, a recipient of a National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellow Award, which sounds very impressive to me. Um, he has a master's degree already in aerospace engineering and uh, is already an accomplished researcher in the fields of space physics and satellite uh, navigation, which puts him into the realm of a real scientist, I think. I mean, uh, unlike the rest of us that work on the atmosphere of the sun, he actually has to get his answers right. Anyway, um, he has a bachelor's degree in uh, aerospace engineering from the University of Tennessee and he's very passionate about the study of space and today he's going to talk to us about living with a star and this was a TED talk. I'm wondering what a TED talk is so I hope he'll explain that. So I'll hand it over to Ryan. What does it mean to live with a star? Well, let me explain. Oh, can higher up. Is that better? No? All right. Well, what does it mean to live with a star? Well, let me explain. I have here in my hand a single grain of salt. You may just have to take my word for that. Imagine this is us our entire world. To represent our sun to scale, I'd have to put an orange all the way at the back of this room, over 30 feet away. What's in between is space. This morning, I want to take you into space and show you that although it is absolutely vast, it's not empty. Show you that there's actually weather in space. And this weather comes from the fact that we live with a star the sun. Our roommate, the sun, produces everything we need to sustain life. Our living arrangement even provides some of the most stunningly beautiful displays in the entire solar system, like these, the northern lights. These shimmering blues and reds and purples and greens literally dance across the night sky. But it's not all good. Our roommate is actually pretty fussy, borderline bipolar if we're being honest. And the weather that our roommate creates can be both life-sustaining as well as life-threatening. I remember the first time that I learned that there was weather in space. It was four years ago, and at the time I was just a space nerd, fascinated with Hubble telescope and shuttle launches. <laughs> I know. But one day in class, my professor told me about the Carrington event. This event was named for Richard C. Carrington, just an amateur astronomer whose favorite pastime was to sit in his study, look through his telescope, and sketch features of the solar surface. I know, right? Don't we all? But one day, September 1st, 1859, Carrington witnessed a brilliant burst of light from the sun. He didn't realize it at the time, but this would be the single greatest eruption on record to ever impact the Earth. The energy from Carrington's event draped our planet in some of the most stunningly beautiful northern lights the world had ever seen, spreading as far south as Cuba. People were on the streets in Boston at midnight, reading their newspapers by the light of them. Hikers in the Rocky Mountains awoke to them and started making breakfast thinking that it was dawn. Carrington's event also wreaked havoc on the internet of the day, the telegraph. Induced currents in the wires were so strong they literally shot sparks from the ends and caught fire to telegraph offices. So in a way, Carrington made the connection between the sun and us. But what is space weather actually? To answer that question, we need to look at the sun. When's the last time you went outside and looked at the sun? I mean, really stared. <laughs> Right? This is a terrible idea. But it's just this great constant ball of fire in the sky, right? Oddly enough, really the only relatively constant thing about the sun is what we see every day, sunshine. 
But let's take a closer look, shall we? I want to show you how the sun actually causes space weather. The Solar Dynamics Observatory is a satellite that sits in space, constantly taking pictures of the sun. This observatory can look at our roommate through all kinds of different lenses that show us things we'd otherwise be blind to. Think of this try, like trying to look through, a look, see in the dark versus wearing night vision goggles. What we can do is take all the pictures from this observatory, stitch them together, and create a time lapse of our roommate. And when we do that, what we see is that the sun is a spinning ball of enormous power and is constantly changing. Here we see short, quick bursts of activity, regions of activity appearing and disappearing over the course of months and even years. It's hard to believe that this is the same shining ball we see in the sky every day, isn't it? But let's take a step back and think about some of the science going on here. And to do that, I just want to freeze and zoom in on a single frame from this movie. Here, the Solar Dynamics Observatory is seeing the sun through ultraviolet and X-ray lenses. We can actually see the magnetic field lines because the plasma flowing along them lights them up. These magnetic fields are what gives the sun its power and allows it to create space weather. Sometimes our roommate can throw some pretty serious temper tantrums. These events become the natural disasters of space weather. And in space, there are basically two forms of natural disaster, a solar flare and a coronal mass ejection. If we look at the edge of this same picture, we can actually see a solar flare erupting from the edge of the sun. These flares are explosions of radiation. They reach millions of degrees in temperature and are the equivalent of 100 megaton hydrogen bombs going off at one time. All of this energy arrives at Earth in just eight minutes. These flares are also natural particle accelerators, shooting particles out into space at close to the speed of light. Um, you wouldn't want to be in the way of these particles, but the Earth often is. The second form of space weather natural disaster is a coronal mass ejection, or a CME. These coronal mass ejections occur when the magnetic field in the sun becomes so contorted it literally snaps like a twisted up rubber band, shooting a cloud of material out into space, moving at millions of miles per hour and weighing, and weighing as much as Mount Everest. But what does a CME actually look like? Well, these are basically clouds of material that blow up off the surface of the sun and release a magnetic shockwave out into space. If Earth is in the way, a spectacular clash of forces occurs. When this cloud encounters the sphere around us created by our magnetic field, a spectacular clash occurs, and it changes our magnetic field. And the energy that gets inside is dumped into our atmosphere. This is where the northern lights come from. But because of our space-faring lifestyle and our technological dependence, much more is at stake. This is space weather. So now that we've seen how the sun and how it's changing actually causes space weather, why should we care? Well, on July 23rd, 2012, our roommate went off crazier than usual and produced a Carrington-sized event. This event missed us by one week. In other words, the spot in the sun that caused it had rotated just past the Earth before it blew off. Had it hit, the results would have been devastating. The National Academy of Sciences estimates that in the first year alone, the economic impact would have been $2 trillion. That's 20 Hurricane Katrinas. Why would it have been so bad? Well, the radiation would have knocked out much of our satellite communications and GPS. This is bad news for those of you who like to use your credit cards. Since every time you swipe is a satellite transaction, you would have had trouble even paying for a gallon of gas. Energetic particles could have rendered billion dollar satellites dead in the sky. The energy from the CME cloud that accompanied this event would have induced currents in our electrical grid on Earth. And an event of this size would have been too much for our unprepared grid. 
leading to blackouts for tens of millions of people. Now, we don't do well without power. Our lives are virtually dependent on things that plug into the wall. Conservative estimates say it would have taken years to get power turned back on for everyone. Imagine having to live for years without power. We would literally still be picking up the pieces. Well, we're screwed, and that's my talk. Thank you guys so much. <laughs> no. No, we're, we're not actually screwed. We're not actually screwed. And the real question we should be asking ourselves is what can we do about this? <laughs> Just another minute. <laughs> so what can we do about this? Luckily for you, we have a plan. Call it a scientific couples counseling for our roommate and us. The first step in our plan is to study the physics. We now have instruments on Earth and in space studying every part of our interaction with the sun 24-7. We already saw some of the mind-boggling images that the Solar Dynamics Observatory sends back of our roommate. And that's only one piece of an entire fleet of space weather observing satellites constantly looking at the sun. You can think of this fleet as our own personal Twitter feed, constantly updating us on our roommate. Hashtag crazy roommate. We actually just launched another one, Discover. And it's on its way out into deep space now. Our job as physicists are to use these observations to understand space weather to the point of prediction. Imagine your local weatherman reporting, grab your rain jackets because tomorrow there's a 50% chance of rain with a high of 60 degrees. And you may want to put your satellites in safe mode since there's a 75% chance of solar flares with lots of particles expected. And for those of you north of Seattle, you may want to turn an eye skyward tonight since some brilliant northern lights are likely. These are the kind of forecasts we can create with enough understanding of space weather. We aren't there now, though. Our space weather forecasts are where our regular weather forecasts were 50 years ago. And we're working on that, too. We created the Space Weather Prediction Center to address this. They take all of the data from our space weather fleet and combine that with everything that we know about space weather to create forecasts, even industry-specific alerts there are now tens of thousands of people who subscribe to these alerts, individuals and businesses, all people who realize that space weather affects their business or their well-being. A second step in our plan is engineering. With enough understanding of space weather, we can better design our systems, know when to turn them off and protect them, or when to take other mitigative action. If we could tell our electrical engineers just what to expect from space weather, they could guarantee the safety of our grids. For those of us hoping to go to Mars someday, or maybe just to take a ride into space, I'm sure we'll be much more comfortable knowing that the spaceship we're in is designed to protect us from space weather. I've come a long way since that day in class four years ago, not knowing that weather even existed in space, much less how it affected me. But then I heard about the Carrington event, and I learned of the importance of space weather. And I decided to make that my focus of study and my life's work. I started working with that professor, the one who told me about space weather. And today, she's my PhD advisor and close friend. And together, we study the electricity in our atmosphere. And we've already figured out ways we can better engineer our systems. Hopefully, as we continue to learn more and more about this fascinating subject, we can better forecast space weather so we can come to live in harmony with our beautiful and powerful, albeit crazy, roommate, the sun. Thank you. or something. <laughs> we have um, plenty, plenty of times for question, question and comments here. Or we can, you know, 
go get coffee early later on. Um, in fact, we have uh, about uh, 13 or 14 minutes, so we might take an opportunity to talk about a lot of stuff here. But if you have questions, then uh, the, at the back first, and then Alice. Late yesterday, there was a gentleman who spoke, and I've forgotten his name, but he was from the president's office talking about the possibility that there would be a uh, event in the upper atmosphere that would cause a failure of the electrical grid, the electrical grid around the United States, and what preventative measures were going to be taken in case there was such an event, the loss of the electric grid. Right. I mean, it's one of the most important issues with space weather. Um, I think the main thing from our community standpoint is just the, the better forecasting of that. Right now, the best mitigation strategy is just to turn those systems off so the transformers that are at risk aren't at risk when the storm hits. But, you know, we obviously have to have a better uh, lead time. For it was, he was a step beyond that. He was, he was speaking in terms of what would the United States do in case there was a sudden loss of the electric grid. I think you're referring to Bill Murtaugh's talk about the strategic plan. Is that is that right? Right. Yeah. Right. By the way, how much does it cost if you just decide to turn them off? Uh, what what's the cost of a cry wolf situation? I mean, probably. I mean, it, there's a there's a cost to that. I don't know exactly what it is, but it's a lot less than replacing the transformers. The gentleman has another question. Well, apparently it was a, a Bill Murtag, uh, and he was talking on behalf of the National Space Weather Strategy Program, Office of Science and Technology. He spoke at, he apparently spoke at 4.30 yesterday. Right. So, so what's the question? Yeah, what's the, what's, what was the question again? I don't, I think we'll probably wrap that one up. Um, yeah. So, Alice? Um, so, um, I'm really kind of inspired by your interest <clears throat> that you got interested in in solar physics. And I uh, think Laura is wonderful. But I, also, I really like uh, solar physics as well and space weather. Um, do you have any advice for getting more people interested in it? That's a great question. There's actually a program that we run from CU called We Want Our Future. And it involves graduate students and anyone who wants to be involved going to elementary schools and middle schools and speaking to the, the students about their vision for space. And I know my entry into this community, the, the space physics community, was kind of through aerospace engineering and, and satellite navigation and things like that. So there's a lot of different pathways through, but I think reaching out to young children and the younger generations is really important to just kind of expose them to space early on and let that passion kind of develop in them. So I think that those outreach programs are really important. In 1987, <clears throat> there was an event that shut down the power coming from the north into cities in, in, north, in southern Canada. And that's an example of what could happen. Right. And it's just an induced current in that long power line that came all the way down. And that's just the best example I've seen of current things affect on a on a grid. Right. And there's, there's work, obviously, going both ways, from our community to better forecast these events, but also from the electrical engineering standpoint, where people are working on things like the smart grid, where a too big a current through the system will trip uh, it to shut down itself. So you, don't, you prevent these problems with the transformers, where when the transformer overheats and, and uh, is destroyed, then that's really where you run into those blackouts that are the problem. Right. I'm interested in how you got the idea to do a TED Talk because I believe I saw it on the internet a while back. Are you planning to, and also are you planning to do more TED Talks because it seems like that is an excellent way of, you'll have all of these college students looking at TED Talks on their smartphone. Oh, It's the, technology, entertainment, and design. It's a, it's a series of uh, talks that, about any subject that people give. Um, that's meant to reach the broader community. Um, that's a really good question. I got involved through the TEDx CU, so it's an independently organized one through the University of Colorado. And um, a good friend of mine was on the organizational committee when they put it together last year, and so he encouraged me to apply. And 
space weather was just uh, the most the thing that I was most passionate about. So I decided to speak about that. And as far as kind of going forward with that, I'm going to be on the organizational committee for it this year. And so we're going to, you know, there's always a range of talks, but I'm definitely going to push for a couple of science talks in there as well. If you uh, haven't seen a TED talk, let me commend to you uh, one that was um, given by a chap, or has been given a number of times by a chap, um, who uh, the title of his talk is, How Do You Make a Dinosaur Out of a Chicken? And uh, this is an interesting talk, and it has the elements of a TED talk, which in, in which the, um, the person who's giving it identifies as bona fides. He shows his, his uh, sense of humor, and, and that engages the audience. It's a very interesting technique. I think you'd be interested in it. What I want to talk about is something that was brought up back here, which is the issue of risk. And that is uh, Dr. White and I, in our younger age, were involved in a military discipline called space weather. And in point of fact, it was touched on yesterday, uh, uh, Walt Roberts had a classified thesis because he and uh, some others had discovered a, a, an effect which was called the Bell Glazer effect. And um, that allowed you to make some estimate in the future at about two weeks distance about uh, UHF, rop rip <laughs> UHF propagation um, fidelity. And um, that in the interest, that generally is why a lot of uh, solar physics was embedded in um, military laboratories like NRL and uh, AFCRL and others. Um, and it's the issue of risk. And that's a fairly straightforward thing. If you're deploying uh, uh, Willie Victor 47 reconnaissance aircraft over the North Pole and further into the Soviet airspace, uh, in order to do electronic intelligence work, you don't really want to have a disturbed ionosphere so you can't radio the data back. And so what's the risk? Well, there's the risk of national treasure and human blood. There's the risk of just the cost of the mission. You just wasted your time if you knew it was going to be a bad day in, uh, in, in the aurora. So the question is, from a societal standpoint, what is the risk of a space weather storm? Now, there, there's some interesting things that are going on. Uh, this has been studied in Northern Europe over the past couple of years. There was a very, very uh, illustrative example in uh, South Africa a few years back where there was a greater than 100 nanotesla um, uh, uh, DST event while they had about a million people working underground. And 14 transformers were burned up. And these have not all been replaced yet. So that was a damage to the economy. So this is beginning to get to the point of what is the risk of a bad call. And uh, that has now been taken up. And I have just recently, in the last week or two, seen a report that was, um, eh, I think it was finance is the right word, by Swiss Re. Now, if you're not familiar with the reinsurance industry, Swiss Re is one of the big reinsurers. They'll, they'll talk to somebody like State Farm and all their, all their other competitors and lay off their bets in one shot. And they were, have done a study of how do, would they lay off the risk of a space weather event. And there's another example that's very, very good, uh, which is the, something called the derecho storm of 2010 which uh, left uh, where I live in Maryland about a quarter of a million people with an allowed electric power for about 10, 12 days. And, and, and the point of the fact is, if you hadn't thought about it, our civilization is vitally, and vital meaning required to sustain life, vitally dependent on a constant supply of AC electric power. I live on the 10th floor of a building, and I'm, I'm in medium good shape after having a knee replaced, and I can make four trips a day up to my 10th floor apartment. And we've got a little duck pond that's kind of fetid out in front. And I could get a couple buckets of water maybe four times a day, and that would get us enough to flush the toilet and whatnot. But we get all our meds from a little store that's down the street, and uh, if they don't deliver, well, we carry about 10, 12 days of medication uh, margin. So this is this is a way of trying to evaluate risk, and that, that tells you what the price is of a bad call. And that is not available. Well, I'm, gonna, I'm really 
you gave me the microphone, and I'm going to tell you about living with a star. And this is the thing you should say to yourself, is not that we need this or that device for better weather prediction. There was a solar system-wide warning device in operation during the um, big flare that was the Carrington analog. There was not one smell of that propagated over the internet because, 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 why is that? It's because of the internal uh, impedance on the Earth for rapidly collecting and disseminating that data. The, the assets come from NASA and they are made to, made available on the internet as fast as possible. But the difficulty with all warning systems is the last half mile down to the beach for the tsunami warning. And um, this is the place where some real work needs to be done. Now, you hustled me out of here, but let me just say the words so that I can say that I've said them. At the center of our solar system, there is a magnetic variable star. It drives the Earth, all the planets, and it sculptures space itself. There are cultural and intellectual benefits that come from studying this, but there have been real real societal benefits, which are both political and economic, which uh, devolve from uh, research results of this area. And that is the place where space weather can play a part. Thank you. Are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to get back to, uh, you can sit down, that's okay, I'm not asking you. Uh, I want to get back to the grid itself. Uh, two points. Number one, the most critical point in the grid, obviously, are the transformers uh, that could take years to replace. One thing that can be done to protect them is to place a grounded Faraday cage uh, around those transformers. That would be step one. Number two is that the uh, control of the grid is primarily regional. It's not national. So that a sh you can't just go shut down a switch and turn off electricity. I mean, uh, there will be a backup surge, and it can propagate. And what is really needed is an international system over overwatching this grid, and a uh, backup uh, dump system, because you'll have still you'll have coal fire, et cetera, behind it uh, that you, you can't just turn off. It has to gradually uh, reduce the power delivery in the grid. So uh, there's a lot can be done uh, from a federal level on uh, protecting the grid, and they should get on with it. Perhaps we should have. Uh... It is, and it's all it's available in a couple of different spots. It'll be available on this uh, meeting's website, and then it'll also be available. It's available on the TED website as well. Perhaps we can have one more, and then a chance for Ryan to respond a little bit, and then we'll move on. Sure, I just have a, a comment actually as opposed to a question. Uh, this issue with uh, space weather's impact on the electric grid in particular is gaining a lot of notice, particularly within NSF. Uh, they have an interdisciplinary program uh, called Interdisciplinary Research in, in Hazards and Disasters. It's partnered with the Sustainability Science and Engineering, the SEAS program. So Hazard SEAS uh, was an opportunity that was announced last year. University of Illinois actually partnered with both uh, power engineering groups, uh, to some extent with geologists, because ground conductivity plays a big role in how uh, able those ionospheric currents are able to couple into the ground. Uh, but this is uh, essentially this is a, an area where uh, a multidisciplinary uh, approach is required, and I think that uh, space physicists and and uh, solar physicists have a, an opportunity here to work with. Uh, power engineers and, and other scientists in different fields to tackle this very important problem. Thank you. Ryan does not have a uh, comment, so um, we're running short. Uh, I'm going to cut this discussion, but we do have Dolores, and I thought it was important to include her. <laughs> Thank you. When I'm not busy teaching classes that involve students like uh, Ryan, uh, one of the other things that I do is edit Space Weather Journal. Uh, and I have learned in very hard and rapid fashion about the business of gra geomagnetically induced currents. As a matter of fact, we're about to produce a special collection that involves probably 90 papers 
that have published in Space Weather Journal and across the AGU, um, the whole AGU realm. Um, this is, shall I say, quite controversial. Um, I, I get emails on a regular basis about what papers to include, what papers to not include. Uh, I'm seeking a commentary from as many in the community as I can. But I, I just wanted to say that it is fantastic to have the ability to bring these kinds of things not only to, this, to the scientific community, but to have students like Ryan and other graduate students that I will be engaging in, um, I hope, a more online fashion uh, to, to continue to bring these kinds of things to the forefront. And uh, I'm one of the luckiest advisors in the world to have students like Ryan and others that are going to follow him on. Okay, so that we have to move on. Let's thank Ryan uh, and thank you all for a very, uh, thank you so much. Thank you all very much for the uh, very nice discussion. Now, 